dare great things for Christ. Christ calls us to dare great things. In the marketplace, as well as in the mission field, there has never been a time like the present for the spirit of the Catholic entrepreneur. Now is the time for men and women of great courage and great vision to engage our church and our culture. Now is the time to dare great things. And here is your host as we dare great things, Father Nathan Cromley, the president and founder of the St. John Institute. It has been said that success is more difficult to handle than failure. For those of us striving for success, this can be hard to hear. How can I be successful with success? And why do worldly honors trip up more people than difficulty and challenge? St. Thomas Aquinas tackles this question when he treats the virtue of magnanimity. How can Christians really strive after greatness and stay humble? This is the secret of the virtues and the secret St. Thomas Aquinas teaches about in his Summa Theologica. All right, I want to tackle a question that I know a lot of you have. And it's at the essence, I think, of all that we've been talking about concerning the virtues in this whole session here. And this is namely this. If I become great, am I not opposing myself to God? If I become great and love higher things, am I not separating myself from my fellow human beings? Many of whom seem to have no desire for these higher things. I would even say most of whom seem to have no desire for these higher things. How is it that I can stay truly humble with respect to God and truly in concord and in harmony with everybody around me if I insist on trying to dare great things? It's a legitimate question, and I think it's one that haunts, so to speak, everyone who actually tries to do some of the great things. And by great things, I'm not talking about founding your business, although I kind of am, <laughs> right? It's a, it's a great thing to found your business. But like even beyond that, great things like having intelligent conversation, reading books that are nonfiction. For, imagine that, right? Uh, trying to, to bring intelligence into a political debate that obviously has truth on both sides of the spectrum, and yet somehow or other is becoming increasingly divisive. How is it that I can, I can try to navigate the deep questions of morality, accepting that there must be principles and must be truth, even while insisting that we need to treat everyone with dignity and openness? How can I strive, in other words, for greatness? And at the same time, take into account my own defects, my own weakness. Right? What most people do, honestly, is they don't even try anymore. Most people around us have become convinced that because they're aware of their own weakness, they should never strive for greatness. Or because they are aware of their, the importance of fraternal harmony and friendship and companionship, they should never try to differentiate themselves by questions such as truth, right? And, and, that, and therefore, you get two things. On the one hand, you get the approval of yourself, that, and that you were genuinely esteemed humble in your own eyes. And then the other way, you get the acceptance of the crowd of people who really say you are one of us, one of the members of the greater herd of humanity. <laughs> and the, the problem is that in both of those examples, you lose something wonderful. And that's your ability to strive after things that are bigger than you, to expand yourself into new realms, to stretch beyond your defects. I mean, it, 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 think about this. If we all just were to say, we all are sinners, we're all broken people, we're all in, incompetent of various things, therefore we do not have the right to strive to, to be saints, to strive to give love, to strive after a greater sense of dignity and honor. Well, no one would. We'd all just admit we are fallen and therefore we cannot get up again. Right? But this is not the Christian message. And, and, we've, and when we do that, when we, when we self-condemn ourselves, uh, we end up doing the work of the evil one and, and negating the work of the Savior. In fact, the Savior came for sinners and the healer for the sick and the, the one who will unite us again for the broken. 
And what does that require from us? It requires from us, yes, an awareness of our littleness, which is proper to humility, but it also requires, and this is what's so important, that incredible strength of love to say, and yet he loves me still in his mercy. And when I receive the mercy of Christ into my soul, and really and, and truly his approval of me, his affirmation of me, not based upon my own merits, but based upon the sheer power of his grace, well, then I have to rise from the mat, so to speak, or from where I have been cast down in my own brokenness, and I have to strive again. Uh, we, we lack that message today in our Christianity, which is why we lack leadership. We've all just accepted, I'm not a good dad, I'm not a good grandpa, I'm not a good business owner, I'm not good at a lot of things, right? So it's like, congratulations, you know, you, you, you've done the scorecard and you've looked and you've seen your defects. This is very valuable, right? This is the source of humility. It'll keep you from striving after great things disordinately or, or not taking into account the, the place that God has assigned for you in the world, which is just fine, but it's not okay when it becomes an excuse that to allow yourself to discount the things that God wants to do with you despite your sins. Imagine if Simon Peter were to, were to, have, were, were to have denied Jesus when he says, Simon Peter, do you love me? Can you imagine if he said, well, not really, Jesus. I mean, <laughs> I've, I've pretty much proven to you that I, I, don't, I don't really love you, you know. And Jesus being like, wait a second, stop, stop. Do you love me? Simon Peter, feed my sheep, right? He, he'll never even get to the feed my sheep if he doesn't allow himself to say, I do love you by your grace. But because he does, well, then he has to do this very high thing, this incredible great deed, feeding the sheep of Christ, even though he was an, an, a, a, a pope who denied him three times in the presence of his enemies. Right, So a tremendous fall that has now been transformed into a tremendous gift. But you see, two things are required. The humility in Peter to recognize that he fell. The humility in Peter to see that, in fact, he was capable of doing evil. But then the desire in Peter to be faithful to the demands of love. And therefore to give himself an incredible way, however Christ wants to give him. And that's that second thing that second strength there that St. Thomas Aquinas refers to as a greatness of soul, magnanimity. It's a hard word to pronounce, but that's what it means. Magnus means great. Anima means soul, the greatness of soul. And, and honestly, folks, today we, we just discount that because if you're not on the, the end of saying, I'm going to knock myself out of the race or knock myself out of the ring, so to speak, I don't even need an enemy to do it. I'm just going to admit that I'm a failure. Then you have the other side, which is the voice of the crowd, simply saying, don't differentiate yourself from us. If you want to be accepting and accepted by us, you need to stop looking for anything that's going to challenge us. Just get rid of challenge in your life. Get rid of any differentiating factor in yourself and you'll be one with the rest of us. Well, I mean, you could say many people choose to do that. I'd actually say a lot of people choose to do that. But what happens when you choose to do that? Well, truth goes out the window. And when truth goes out the window, there's nothing to navigate, allow that crowd to navigate its course successfully. And you could find yourself with a whole bunch of other lemmings running right over the top of a cliff. <laughs> and so you, you could take that chance if you want to, but that also is not what God calls us to. God doesn't ask us to stay in the crowd with everyone else. He says, follow me. Well, that requires a greatness of heart. Do, will you allow yourself to strive after the great things that God is calling you to do? The conversations, the way of rearing your children, the insistence on a proper Christian education for your kids, or in the workplace environment, really going after your work as if it was your mission. You know, and not just and not just allowing it to be diluted by the way everyone else works around you. You're not there for everyone else when you dare after something great. You're there after God, who is the source of all greatness. And that virtue that allows you to do that, that's what Aquinas calls magnanimity. And I want to look at that with you and really examine it because there's a lot 
that's in here that's very powerful and can have a big impact on the way that we do our business and the way that we lead our companies. And I, I can't wait to unpack it with you. Does your family matter? Join the St. John Leadership Network and receive a family mission infographic that will help you focus on your family. To learn more, go to www.stjohnleadershipnetwork.org slash member and join for free today. So St. Thomas Aquinas was this amazing priest who lived in the 13th century, uh, had an amazing mind. And he wrote a book called the Summa Theologica in which he, it's a Latin phrase, right? And it basically is like a summary of theology. It's an overview of theology, but he traces the work that God does inside of a human person that makes that human person God-like. And that work that God does is always focused on this thing he calls virtues. Virtues are the excellences that our soul uh, takes on by repeatedly doing great things or good acts, right? The excellence of temperance, the excellence of justice, the excellence of fortitude, right? Th these are examples, the excellence of prudence. In other words, the Christian vision for how a person develops is that the person becomes stable in doing good things by acquiring that stability in these things we call virtues. So virtues are not something added on to the soul as much as they are places where the soul really shines. And all of us who are people of success or uh, striving after success have to navigate something that's very difficult. Some people would even say it's more difficult to navigate success than it is to navigate failure. With failure, at least you know you're at the bottom and there's one direction you can go, which is up. But when you become successful, you have money, you have things, you have title, you have clout, you have a reputation. Where do you go with it? And sometimes when we finally have sold our company, sold our business, and we're sitting there having achieved everything people would dream of achieving in their lifetime, and yet we are still young and have vim and vigor, we say, what more is there to do? I've, met, I've dealt with many people who are, who are in, in basically enthralled with their work or involved heavily in their working lives and who don't know what, how to keep going forward that, without working. So they don't want to retire because there's nothing more for them to do. A lot of us find ourselves in this situation, right? It's easier, in other words, when you're striving after something than you've actually achieved it. And Aquinas analyzes that and he says, how do we actually navigate the honors that can come our way at, from success. When people all look at you and say that you are good or that you are approved or that you made the team, this is, a, I mean, it, it can be very unnerving because if you don't notice it, immediately you could go right back to currying the favor of the people who claim that somehow you no longer need it, right? When, they, when, they, when people give you the title of powerful, of leader, of amazing, it, it, there's a, a, a little bit of a nuance there because are you a leader? Are you powerful? Are you amazing because of God and his gifts to your soul and because of all of the things that he's allowed you to do as you've striven for those things? Or are you a powerful, are you a leader? Are you amazing because they've said so? And they, see the, the crowd, in other words, is both suffocating for those who want to stay small and simply win their approval, but it reaches its tentacles higher also by bequeathing honors that depend upon its opinion of you. And if you achieve success in the world's eyes and in worldly honors in a way that in its really depends upon their willingness to bequeath those honors to you, you can, be, can become beholden to them. And therefore, not truly great. True greatness can only come with a creature's respect to God. And, and what I mean by that isn't that they, they shun the world because obviously you're in your law office, you're there at your surgical table, you are doing your accounting work, you need to be great in the world and you really are great at those things. And, and so I'm not saying that you, you, you're, you're great independently of the world. But the true greatness of the soul is how you approach those things and the way that you achieve them and do them coming from a principle that's inside of you. And that's where God operates. 
True greatness of a person, in other words, is in the way that they live, the way that they work, and that's, uh, that's between them and their creator. And in that sacred zone, if you can achieve a, a stable ability to work well, to, to choose wisely, to think correctly, and you approach life consistently in that basis, well, you will become a truly good person. But it won't be because other people recognize you as such. They might not even do so. There are so many wonderful people out there that never get honored by anybody. I would even say most of the good people out there aren't even honored by anybody. We all know this. We know that if the greatest people in our lives are oftentimes the people that the world has overlooked and that can make us self-conscious because you say, yeah, what about me? I mean, here I am and everyone thinks I'm great. And I'm like, well, it's not so much what everyone thinks about you, whether it's to the negative or to the positive. It's about what you really are and who you really are and what you really are. That's found in the eyes of God and the truth about ourselves is found in God. And so Aquinas says the question about navigating honors and having this greatness of spirit, the foundational principle is that the greatness of any leader comes from, from the vision that God has of them. The way that God looks at you and not the way that your wife looks at you or the way that your kids look at you or the way that your neighbors look at you. And I know that that's very hard because it can be either, it can be either negative or it can be uplifting, right? It's the same way. I mean, if your wife thinks you're the greatest thing since sliced bread, it's going to be kind of hard for you to, to get over that and to really accept that you want to be better, right? So in, or in other words, always beware of allowing other people's vision of you to define you. The vision that's supposed to define us is the way that God looks at us. The great things that are in God. The, the way he judges us. And that, my friends, liberates us from so many things and sets us on the course for real amazing growth. Daring great things, in other words, comes from staring deep into the heights and longing for the God who has made you for himself. And when people do that, of course, like rocket ships, they burst off the launch pad to go into an itinerary that is completely free of the gravitational pull of this earth. And that's what we're made to do. That's why we're leaders. We will lead the world when we're free from it, <laughs> right? And when we put our anchor instead into the truth of who we are, well, that's the first principle. And I think it's foundational. It's what allows a, a Christian leader to not be afraid of the goods of this world. You know what Aquinas says? He actually says the magnanimous man despises external goods inasmuch as he does not think them so great as to be bound to do anything unbecoming for their sake. Right? So when it comes to wealth, a great house, a car, a truly good person, a great person will actually say, I don't, I mean, like, I'm not going to sacrifice my dignity or the truth of who I am in order to acquire those things. Yet, says Aquinas, he does not despise them, but that he esteems them useful for the accomplishment of virtuous deeds. And Aquinas says, actually, the, the, the great person will want to have great things and wealth and all the and prestige and all those things so that he can do wonderful things with them. Right? You see, when you're free from this world and the honors heaped upon you, you can lead it. You can use the things that you have to do good. And actually, you can do a lot of good with them. And that's the advantage, the Christian advantage. When you let Jesus Christ be the king of your life and the judge of your life and the perspective of greatness, the definition of greatness for your life, you're able to then bestow copious bounty upon everyone around you and enable them to grow in great ways too. The best leaders are the followers of Christ. Would you like your business to become a virtuous workplace? Would you like Father Nathan to come to an event in your town? Visit www.stjohnleadershipnetwork.org slash r-events and join for free today. So what then is magnanimity? What is this greatness of soul that Aquinas talks about? And for Aquinas, it's very simple. It's to receive the gifts of God that he has given you 
and to dare to do good things through them, to expand the giftedness that you have, to want to have the honor of God, right? To be honored by God. And there's plenty of things that are in the, in the Bible that refer to this about the fact that God holds in high esteem the person who fears him, for example, right? So when you, when you gain, in other words, a sense of God and his love for you, you want to respond to that love in the most dignified and in the best fashion you can. Well, that, that means that you're actually an overachiever, if you want to think of it in that terms, but like an overachiever in love. I mean, how, how much can I love? How deeply can I love? How much can I give to love? Right? This, is, this is what love is all about. St. Bernard used to put it so beautifully. He said, love knows no other measurement than love itself. There's no limit to love except love. Meaning you can't love too much. Well, yeah, if you actually strive, right? But a lot of us don't. We're like, well, my work life, that doesn't have anything to do with my spiritual life. I'm like, well, that's not very loving. I mean, who, who wants when you're in love with someone to say, well, I love you with everything, every, everything that I have except this and this and this and this and this, which actually have nothing to do with our relationship. You know, it's like, be, in a sense, you're kind of limiting your love when you do that, right? Well, I don't want you to limit your love. I don't want you to look at your opportunities that you have every day, every day for eight to 10 hours a day when you're at work as somehow outside of your Christian faith. No, I mean, if it's something that you do and that flows from you, it's something that flows from your love, the love that motivates everything that you do. And that means that everything that you do can and should take on the character of that love that you have. Well, how do I do that? How do I acquire the virtues? By loving in the circumstances that I find myself and seeking to give that, that impetus and free reign to the love that I have inside of me in every circumstance and position and relationship in my life, I will become more and more capable of loving freely and loving well. Right? So when it looks like, therefore, striving to give the best of myself in everything, it means letting love push me towards greatness. Now, not, not defined in a worldly sense of greatness. Greatness in this, as defined as being the best version of myself, being the, the, the best, living the best life that I can live. Not being satisfied, in other words, by letting my failures define me ever. My failures in my family, my failures in my marriage, my failures at business, my failures in, in standing up for Christ in the world. You just cannot allow that to define you. And I know it's hard because it means that we have to overcome the fear that, that can really cripple us and, and the cowardice that can cripple us. What will people think? What will they say? What will the consequences be? I know. And, but this is called sanctification, everybody. <laughs> it's not supposed to be easy. Jesus says at one point, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violence, uh, violent are those who are, are winning the day or who are taking the kingdom of heaven. You cannot, in other words, just be passive about your Christian life. If you're passive about your Christian life, you're going to be passive about you. And you, it's like, try rearing a child, for example, who doesn't care who they are. It doesn't care what they're trying to do. You can't. You're like, uh oh, this is bad. If I've got an eight-year-old boy or a 10-year-old boy and they don't really care about themselves and they lack self-esteem and self-motivation, you're like, this is bad. Because when they hit 12 or 14, they're going to fill that void and that emptiness with stuff that's going to pollute them, right? Well, I'm here to say the same thing about you. I mean, if you're not striving to be a better dad, a better grandfather, right? If, you, if you're not striving to live a prayer life that's intense and read your Bible, well, then you're making a void that will be filled by things that can take you down. And, I'm, and the simple truth is that you cannot give up on yourself and on the fight of life without giving up on Christ. As soon as you accept Christ in your life, you have to accept to strive, to get up again, to keep on moving forward, to have the hunger and the thirst of the kingdom of heaven in your soul. And, and, and I get it that it's hard, but I also give, get it that it's glorious. And I challenge you to accept that glory and accept that as your native home. This is what it means to be magnanimous. It means, it means to have this greatness of heart to say, I'm going after the high things. 
All right, I'm going after the good things. I'm going after good relationships and healthy boundaries, but I'm also going after skill and I'm going after growth and I'm going after things that'll make me stretch. Why? Because I have a fire inside of my heart called love and that love is pushing me. The love of for Christ, the love for my wife, the love for my kids, right? It's making me be great. And Aquinas says, wouldn't it be amazing if that could be your stable disposition? <laughs> wouldn't you be an amazing person, right? And I don't even say more than an amazing person. You would be an attractive leader. Everybody wants to follow winners. They all want to follow people who think that they got some place that they want to go, some place that they want to be. And I'm like, yeah, isn't that you? And when you're a Christian, you have this stable disposition in you that says, I'm made for the greatness. Again, not as the world defines it. I don't really care how the world defines it. I'm made to be good and to be loving and to make good decisions and speak well and be cultured. And no one's going to take away from me the fire and the desire that's in me to make that happen. Well, my friends, Jesus doesn't want you. Instead, he, he asks you to acquire that virtue, that stable disposition that says the honor that I'm seeking is an honor from God, the honor that God gives to his creatures who have, who have fulfilled themselves, been fulfilled by his grace, but who have striven after that great life. And, I, and, and therefore, the lesser honors of this world don't even perturb me. I'm fine with accepting them insofar as like it could help me uh, along the way to do good things for other people. But the real thing that I'm striving for is that judgment day, that sweet judgment hour when Jesus will, sell, what will say, well done, my good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master. And that's what keeps me pushing along. And, and, and I will not let go of that great vision of that great day. Dare great things for Christ. Share your feedback with Father Nathan. Send us an email at info at stjohninstitute.org. That's info at stjohninstitute.org. And don't forget to subscribe to premium video content to form, unite, and inspire you at Eagle Eye Pro on our website, eagleeyeministries.org. That's eagleeyeministries.org.